go ahead and admit everyone in. Okay. All right. Hello, everybody, and welcome back again to the UCF AVS Astrochemistry webinar. This is actually our final episode. Uh, today we have Dr. Niels Lichtering from the University of Bern speaking on, uh, giving a, a talk on searching for the chemical fingerprints of extraterrestrial life. So again, we wanna once again reiterate our special announcement that the AVS 2020 International Twitter Poster Competition now has an astrochemistry and space science category. There is a $500 cash prize and you do not need to be a AVS member to join. It's a $10 registration for non-members, $5 for members. The registration deadline is July 6th. Go to this link at the bottom uh, here to register. Uh, I want to again let you guys know that this is organized by the uh, American Vacuum Society at the University of Central Florida, of which I am the chair, and Katie Slavichinska is the vice chair. The webinar format is a 45-minute talk with a 15-minute Q&A session afterwards. You write your questions in the chat. We have everyone muted, so they don't try to unmute yourself. Just write your question in the chat, and at the end, we'll get to them. And today's speaker, again, as I mentioned, from the University of Bern Center for Space and Habitability is Dr. Niels Lichtring, uh, speaking on searching for the chemical fingerprints of extraterrestrial life. Niels Lichtring is an astrochemist and planetary scientist with an interest in the origin of life question. He works on astrochem astrochemical laboratory experiments and observations, and on the development of instruments for planetary science missions. Dr. Lichtring obtained his bachelor's and master's in physical chemistry at the Free Universiteit uh, Amsterdam, Free University Amsterdam, before earning his PhD degree at Leiden Observatory in 2017 with the thesis, The Astrochemical Factor, A Solid Base for Interstellar Reactions. This thesis was awarded the 2018 IAU Division B PhD Prize. In 2018, Dr. Lichtring started as a Center for Space and Habitability postdoc in the Space Science Group of the University of Bern, Switzerland. Here he is developing ORIGIN and other laser mass spectrometry uh, systems, in, uh, systems for the in-situ chemical investigation of solar system objects. So without further ado, I'll go ahead and stop my screen share and let Dr. Lichtring, take it over from here. All right. Thank you. Let's go to the first slide. So yes, uh, thank you, Brian and uh, Katie, of course, for including me in this seminar series. And thank you all for joining for this final presentation. So what I will be talking about is indeed the search for the chemical fingerprints of extraterrestrial life. Now, what we have seen in previous talks is a lot of astrochemistry taking place in the interstellar medium, seen all kinds of things like the formation of prebiotic molecules, uh, nuclear bases, um, and where they might be present, for example, in asteroids and all the asteroid return missions that you can do on them. We've even gone as far as seeing some chemistry that is taking place in the atmosphere of Titan, but today, we'll be heading a bit more into the planetary science and astrobiology field and look for the chemical traces of life once that, or if that, if that has emerged. Now, what I will specifically be talking about is the space instruments that can detect these traces and which kind of chemical tracers they can detect. We will be talking about two examples. One is Mars. Uh, which will be a template for life that has gone extinct. And on the other hand, there will be Europa, the moon of Jupiter, which we will use as a sort of template for existing life. Now, of course, we don't know about any form of life outside of Earth, if that exists or if that does not. We also don't know if uh, life on Mars has gone extinct or is still alive. Uh, we won't know until we find it. But... Having said that, there is a couple of very good reasons to actually think that life on Mars is extinct and life on Europa um, yeah, is still existing. 
And that basically has to do with the ingredients for life. And big disclaimer here, of course, this is the ingredients for life as we know it. So it's really based on what we see on Earth. Now, life on Earth, um, roughly speaking, requires three ingredients. First one is purely energy. Uh, you need photons for photosynthesis. Uh, geothermal energy can help contribute to uh, so-called redox reactions uh, that basically uh, uh, help the flow of electrons and that really drives the energy source of life itself. So you need a form of energy. The second thing is, of course, nutrients. Uh, life as we know it is carbon-based, contains a lot of oxygen, nitrogen, uh, sulfur, phosphor. So those elements need to be available to keep life running and to build new cells. Um, and at the same time, there needs to be a, fair, uh, a variety of minerals for all kinds of catalytic properties and whatever not. Now, the final ingredient, and that's one of the most important ones, is that we need liquid water. Liquid water is really the medium in which uh, life can come together, build cell membranes, for example, can transport nutrients. So liquid water is essential for life to exist. If we take those three factors and then look at Mars, then we can look at, for example, the nutrients. And the nutrient situation on Mars oops, is quite okay. We have had landers already uh, investigate the soil of Mars, and we know that there is all kinds of organic elements and, and molecules uh, available there. So, for example, here you see a result of the Curiosity rover on Mars, which found this nice carbon molecule, it's very complex carbon molecule. Now, of course, there's all sorts of minerals available, so the nutrient situation is okay on Mars. Now, the second thing would be the energy. Of course, Mars collects quite a bit of solar radiation, but in fact, it's actually collecting too much solar radiation. And this has partially to do with the fact that Mars has no noticeable magnetic field anymore, which means that the solar wind has blasted away the atmosphere of Mars for a large extent. Now, in turn, this means that UV radiation, especially the very energetic UV radiation, is not really blocked anymore and hits the surface of Mars. Now, that results in the destruction of all kinds of molecules and also in potential life. So, energy-wise, there's actually too much energy on the surface of Mars right now. Now, the most important thing is actually water. We have seen signs on Mars that there used to be liquid water on that surface, as you can see in this nice picture with a dried up riverbed on Mars. Uh, but in present day, it has actually lost most of, it water, of its water and what water remains that is mostly frozen out in its surface. So there's not really a liquid medium anymore for life to exist in, in Mars. Now, all these lines of evidence have led to the conclusion that life either has gone extinct already on Mars, if it ever existed, or it is some form of microbial life that exists in the subsurface uh, where it's hiding away from radiation. Now, quite different is the situation on Europa, actually. And here we'll first look at the water situation, because Europa actually on its outside has this very uh, inhospitable icy shell, but underneath it has a liquid ocean of water. Now we know this from various uh, measurements, mainly from the Galileo uh, space mission, uh, which among other things measured the magnetic field of Jupiter actually, and saw that Europa is inducing perturbations to this magnetic field. And this is a sign that there is uh, some electric conductivity going on in Europa's core, which is interpreted as uh, yeah, liquid water, which contains a lot of salts. So we know that there is water underneath Europa's surface, and that also means that we know that there is some form of heating, otherwise we couldn't have liquid water. Now, this energy source is probably a combination of residual heat of the formation of Europa, um, some component of radioactive uh, elements that are decaying, uh, but mainly it's tidal energy, uh, basically generated by Europa's round trip around Jupiter, which is stretching and compressing Europa's core and subsequently providing the heat that, um, yeah, that warms up this ocean. 
Now, the final piece of evidence for Europa, which is quite important, is that this liquid ocean is in direct contact with the rocky core of Europa. And that means that in the ocean, you can have all the nutrients, uh, all the carbon, all the minerals that are present in this core, and basically access this uh, liquid medium. And this, for example, can happen through so-called hydrothermal vents, of which you see this picture here on the left, um, which we know exist on Earth, for example. And these hydrothermal vents, they, they contain warm water, which is very nutrient-rich, and actually in very uh, deep and inhospitable places, uh, hydrothermal vents are still locations where life can exist. So if this situation is also ongoing on Europa, there's actually a fairly good likelihood that Europa could be habitable underneath its icy shell. Now, if we're looking, looking for uh, life, uh, we're going to do that through its chemical tracers. So we'll be looking at so-called biogenic elements, carbon, nitrogen, phosphor, that kind of stuff, or biomolecules, such as amino acids, nucleobases. Those elements we want to detect. But we not just want to detect them, but we also want to um, determine their abundances. Because just detecting the amino acid glycine or the amino acid alanine uh, will not say anything about the presence of life. And that is nicely highlighted in this bottom graph, where on the left side you see the amino acid composition of the E. coli bacteria, and on the right hand side you see the composition of meteorites. And what this figure really demonstrates is that we need to detect multiple chemical tracers and see that they are in abundances that are much higher that can be explained by abiotic means. Now, this is something that we have been doing already for quite a while, but mainly on Mars. So, for example, the Mars uh, Curiosity rover from NASA is driving around on Mars and looking for these um, elemental signs or molecular signs of life. And to do that, it has a number of uh, instruments on it, and they can be roughly categorized in spectroscopic instruments and mass spectrometric instruments. So what the Curiosity rover has is, for example, the CAM-CAM, which is a laser-induced uh, breakdown spectroscopy tool. Uh, it also has a so-called uh, gas chromatography mass spectrometry unit, in the SAM unit. Now let's have a look at some of those instruments. So for example, this laser-induced breakdown spectroscopy. Uh, this basically works by shooting a laser at a rocky uh, material, something else you want to analyze, and heating it up, generating a plasma. And in that plasma, all the elements that are present in this rock will uh, emit light. And that light you can pick up with spectrograph. Now there is a problem with these kind of techniques, and that is that their sensitivity is not really that great. Uh, this, for example, has to do with the fact that the light that you're generating in your plasma is irradiating in all kinds of different directions. So you don't collect that much light and that uh, lowers your sensitivity. So a lot of the spectroscopic techniques are actually more suitable for a bulk elemental analysis. But if you really want to go to small scales and detect trace elements, uh, for example, from microbial uh, fossils, it's going to be a lot harder to do that with uh, spectroscopic tools. Now, on the other hand, the mass spectrometric techniques, they do have high sensitivity. Here you see such an instrument that has been used on a, a lot of uh, space missions. This one comes specifically from the Viking uh, missions, one of the earliest landers on Mars. And this is so-called pyrolysis uh, gas chromatography mass spectrometer. Now, I don't want to go through all its details, but what I do want to point out is this word gas. All the molecules that you're analyzing with this instrument need to be in the gas phase. And that is somewhat problematic, of course, if all your biomolecules, such as amino acids, are actually solids at any kind of reasonable temperature uh, below 200 degrees Celsius. So that's where the second part comes into play, the pyrolysis step, uh, which basically means we take a soil sample, put it in an oven, and crank up the heat and see what kind of uh, complex molecules or other species evaporate. And then we can analyze that with our chromatography and uh, mass spectrometry technique. Now, the problem here, which um, has become clear over the past couple of years, is that in those soil samples, 
you also have minerals and you have salts. So Mars is, for example, very famous for its perchlorate salts in its surface. Uh, Europa is thought to have a lot of sodium chloride in its surface. And those things will be present in the oven. And the thing that they will do when you heat up these samples with these materials in them is they will create radical uh, oxygens, reactive radicals. And they can, for example, make uh, hydrogen chloride, a very strong acid. Now, if you have these species in combination with your organic molecules, they will effectively burn them and you will only form CO2 and water. So you need to have a lot of biomaterial to actually detect something. And if that's not the case, then you're not really going to detect uh, the signs of life. So within the community, this has led to the following situation that we are basically looking for an instrument which has very high sensitivity, um, very high spatial resolution to pick up and analyze the chemical compounds of, for example, fossilized microbial life. And it does not do any chemical alteration of your sample in the same way that the salts can do in the pyrolysis step of GCMS. Now, what we think we have uh, as the solution to that is basically laser mass spectrometry techniques. We'll go to a couple of uh, examples or just to demonstrate how the uh, laser mass spectrometry technique works. Um, this is basically a class of a group of techniques. Uh, on the one hand side, we have laser desorption. Um, and in this concept, you use a low or relatively low energy laser pulse and shoot that on a surface which contains some biomolecules. And the low energy laser pulse will actually break the physisorb bonds of the molecules on this surface and introduce them to the gas phase. And during that introduction step, at the same time, they are ionized. Now, this is a very soft ionization process as well. So you have very limited molecular fragmentation. So this is a really a perfect uh, technique for molecule analysis. On the other hand, you have the so-called laser ablation technique. Uh, and in this case, you use really high powered laser pulses. And when you shoot those at your surface, you completely atomize your sample and ionize them and then release them to the gas phase. And they're very well suited to do an elemental uh, analysis of a sample. And what is also a very good tool that they have is that you can use multiple laser pulses to scrape off layers and layers of material and, for example, find elements, biogenic elements of interest in the subsurface of rocky material. Now, once you have formed your ions with the laser uh, step, you can analyze them with a mass spectrometric technique. Uh, we do that with uh, so-called time of flight mass spectrometry. We have our ions, we have a time of flight tube, we introduce them into this time of flight tube, and basically their travel time determines their mass, and based on their mass, we can identify certain elements or molecules. Now, before continuing to our actual um, yeah, prototype instruments that we are developing on the, uh, at the University of Bern, I want to point out a few things, a few rules for space instruments, which basically guide our entire construction process and development process for these instruments. And that's basically that these instruments need to be lightweight, very compact, uh, because we have space constraints on landers, uh, but also space launches cannot be too heavy. Um, Power consumption is a big concern because uh, we need to either bring battery packs or rely on limited amounts of solar radiation uh, impinging on solar panels. And most of all, the technique need to, needs to be very simple and robust to basically survive a very shaky rocket launch, uh, a couple of years in space, a landing, and a couple of days or even years of operation on the surface of a, of a planet. Now, those concepts you see uh, in our core element of all the techniques of all the laser mass spectrometry prototypes that we are building in the, in the laboratory, and that is this uh, miniature time of flight mass spectrometer. Now, to give you an idea of its size, it's basically the dimensions of a Coca-Cola can. And this mass spectrometer is specifically optimized 
for laser desorption and laser ablation techniques. Uh, we use this one in several prototypes that we have in the laboratory at the University of Bern. Now, one of our older prototypes um, is the so-called LMS machine, very creatively named, um, which is capable of doing elemental analysis. Now, what you see here is, of course, a very bulky laboratory setting, but this miniature time of flight instrument is actually housed within this gray chamber where we can do all our tests on it. And then here on the outside, you see this big black box. That is the femtosecond uh, laser system, which is capable of generating these high power pulses to really do this laser ablation. Now, one of our newer machines that we have only built um, since last year and are working on since then is called Origin, which is meant for uh, molecule detection. Uh, to highlight a bit better the components that go into these systems, I have here its schematic. And what you basically are seeing is a laser system here in blue. For this one, we make use of low power, lower power um, nanosecond laser pulses at 266 nanometers. We have a bunch of optics to guide the beam into a vacuum chamber, which you see right here, which houses again this miniature time of flight mass spectrometer. Now at the bottom of this instrument, we have a sample holder in which we can introduce samples and do all our tests to assess the performance of this machine. Now, again, remember this is a laboratory prototype, but based on these components, you can very easily see that this is a very compact, uh, simple and lightweight system. So perfect for space missions. So let's now look at a couple of examples what laser mass spectrometry can actually do. Um, so of course, this is combined with an entire search methodology uh, before you do your chemical analysis. So the first thing to do is target an area of interest. So let's look at Mars. On Mars, we would definitely go for ancient river systems uh, because at least there used to be water there. So it's likely that life could have existed there. You see this on this picture on the left-hand side, actually. You see this uh, delta of an old river system. Now, in these river systems, if we land with a rover, we can look around for, for example, stromatolite. Now, stromatolite is actually a sedimentary deposit uh, created by cyanobacteria, and it leaves this very distinct geolo geological trace. Um, so with your rover, with a camera, you can look for this thing. Uh, identify something that looks like it and then go for further chemical analysis. Now, then you can study it with a microscope and, for example, find these kind of black spots that may be uh, microfossils and then analyze those uh, for the chemistry and determine if there are biogenic elements present in this microfossil. Now, this last picture was, of course, not from Mars, but this is actually from a 1.8 billion year old gunflint shirt, uh, which comes from Earth, of course. And this is actually something we have used in the laboratory to uh, assess the capability of our LMS instrument to analyze the chemical composition of a microfossil. So we have targeted here four positions. The first one is a blank, and these dark spots, as I said, might be microfossils. And the bottom step, you see the results afterward, after the laser has fired on these positions and has created this nice crater with all the material that is released and has then been analyzed by the mass spectrometer. And that is what you see here. Here you see the um, mass spectrometric results of all four of these spots and all kinds of elements that can be identified there, such as carbon and oxygen, actually. But as I said, just identifying such elements is not enough. So what you really need to do is look at the abundances. And here we take the abundances with respect to silicium. And we look at the number of masses, for example, of mass 12, which is carbon. And if you look at that uh, abundance, you notice that one position, position D actually, has a significantly higher concentration of carbon. So this is a very strong sign that Compared to the other ones, this one is the more likely one to have um, yeah, a microfossil uh, in it. Now, if you compare this uh, or combine this with other lines of evidence, other elements that could uh, indicate biological activity, 
you combine all those lines of evidence, we can actually identify this uh, uh, microfossile as in fact being a microfossile. Now, one of the other things that I talked about was uh, depth profiling, that we can look under the surface of, uh, of a material. And that was done in this uh, specific project on fossils, which are these nice veins that you see here in an uh, aragonite matrix. And just to take a few examples here, what was done is position the laser on various locations. And one of those locations is right next to this vein of a microfossile, and the other one is right on it. And the next thing you see is the analysis that has been performed for various uh, elements, such as sodium, potassium, and here in the bottom panel, magnesium and uh, calcium. And there has been a depth profile performed on these layers. So we're looking into this molecule. Now, what you see here is that some elements um, show up right away with the laser spot that is positioned on this laser vein. But then if we look at the spot next to the vein, we see those same elements showing up at much later, uh, later posi uh, positions, deeper into the material. And this is, of course, very useful because let's say we see something that might be interesting, but we don't detect biogenic elements right away. We can go deeper into the material and analyze that for still those biogenic um, elements. Or maybe your laser just simply missed the target of interest. And in that way, you can still find these biogenic elements that are of interest and prove that life is present or was present on Mars. So now I want to switch gears a bit and move to our other place, Europa, and look for biomolecules on Europa's surface. Now, as you remember, before I said that the life that is present on, or might be present on Europa, is existing in its subsurface ocean. So the first step is, of course, that biomolecules need to get to Europa's surface. And that is actually possible. Um, we know for various ocean worlds that cracks in their surface release uh, subsurface water to the, uh, to the surface. Uh, you can also have the concept of plumes, which drive and push out uh, water and all kinds of other uh, elements to its surface. So these biomolecules can reach uh, yeah, the outer surface of Europa. Now, the next step that we could do is take a lander and position that on Europa's surface uh, to go identify any biomolecules that might be present. Uh, this is one of the ideas for Europa Lander to actually do this type of science. And this is something that is uh, being developed right now by NASA. Now, one of the problems is, of course, that once the lander is on Europa and it can start identifying biomolecules, uh, the problem is that Europa is being irradiated by quite um, energetic electrons. And these energetic electrons will, of course, de destroy your biosignatures of all your biomolecules that may be present in the surface. So not only does your instrument need to be able to identify a biomolecule and determine its abundances, but it also needs to be incredibly sensitive to detect trace amounts of biomolecules that are left after maybe many years of irradiation. Now this is something that we can do with our origin system. Now origin uh, works by actually introducing uh, water droplets uh, that have amino acids uh, introduced in them uh, and we evaporate the water and then form a bio layer on a sample holder. Now, on Europa we can do a similar thing by scooping up some ice from its surface. We simply uh, melt or sublimate that on the sample holder and form this organic layer of all the organic stuff that may be present in the surface ice. Now, next, we take this sample and we introduce it into the origin setup to analyze it and look for these molecules. Now, this is something that we have been testing in the lab. And what we have done is mainly look at amino acids, of which you see here the fragmentation pattern and the detections of these amino acids. Now, for those of you who are a bit familiar with um, mass spectrometry, uh, you will probably note that these mass spectra are very sparse. 
And that is actually one of the powerful things of Origin is that it produces very sparse uh, mass spectra. Now, for those of you that are not familiar with this concept, let me highlight that. Uh, let's look at the mass spectrum of Valley, which we have measured with Origin here. Here we see the mass 74 peak, uh, which is one of the fragments of Valley that's produced. And we see that basically all of the intensity of the mass spectrum is in this one single peak. We see here some minor peaks showing up as well. Uh, those are actually contaminants coming from our steel sample hole. But most of the yeah, intensity is in this one single peak. Now let's compare that with a mass spectrum produced with 70 electron volt electron ionization. And you will see that this main peak still shows up, but there is a lot more fragmentation channels. And this is, of course, problematic. If we are looking at more complex mixtures, uh, then all these channels here will start contributing to these uh, to, uh, to fragmentation patterns of other molecules. And that will severely uh, hamper our identification of biomolecules in complex mixture and make our job basically more difficult. So the fact that we have these sparse fragmentation patterns is really beneficial in identifying molecules in complex mixtures. Now, the second thing that we have been working on is the quantification with this system. Now, the fact that we are um, yeah, absorbing or uh, evaporating the water from these um, droplets, uh, which contain amino acids and then produce this residue is, is somewhat problematic, of course, because of the so-called coffee stain effect. It does not form a uniform layer of biomaterial. And that basically means that if we shoot our laser on this position, we might get 10 times the average concentration of our sample. If we shoot it at this position, we might only get one tenth. Now, if we want to do accurate um, uh, yeah, identifications of the abundances of molecules on Europa's surface, we of course need to be uh, better than this. So what we did is actually apply a very simple trick. We simply shoot an entire row of laser shots over the sample and average all the, uh, the signal. And then we can uh, cont uh, combine or yeah, get an average concentration out of this. And this is something that you see here in this graph uh, for two amino acids, uh, methionine on the left and histidine on the right. And what you're seeing is the mass signals of two masses of these molecules at different laser positions. So we fire at 40 different spots, we fire a laser and we identify the surface composition. And what you see, for example, is that at spot five, you have a really high concentration of methionine, whereas on spot 25, it's not even measurable with the system. Now, if we average all these values out, we get a nice average signal uh, for the concentration. To drive this point even further home, we have actually uh, been doing those tests that we um, deposited uh, molecules or amino acids at different concentrations ranging between 1 and 100 micromolar and we have been measuring the average intensity and what you see here is that there's this beautiful linear correlation between the surface con uh, yeah, the surface concentration and the measured intensity and in that way we can really show that our origin system is really good at quantifying the amino acid material Uh, one other thing that we have also been doing is, of course, uh, investigate how our system performs with complex mixtures. We've now only been looking at individual amino acids, uh, but what if we throw all those 20 amino acids uh, together and then do a measurement? This is what you see in red uh, on the top here. Or there is sodium chloride in Europa's surface, so what uh, happens if we add sodium chloride to our sample and then perform the measurement? As you can see in these mixtures, we can still identify the signatures of these amino acids and um, assign some of the peaks, but not all of them. And especially in sodium chloride sample, what you see here at the bottom, you see that a lot of these peaks are missing. Now, what we can do next is actually increase our laser power. And in that case, you start seeing that there is a whole lot more peaks showing up. And we are basically uh, able to identify the, the missing. Uh, amino acids and uh, identify almost all the compounds in our mixture. 
Now the final step is of course the sensitivity and that was really important on Europa. And what we've plotted here is the sensitivity of our system for various amino acids uh, with a three sigma limit of detection in femtomol per square milliliter. Now, of course, this unit um, is uh, not going to tell you a lot, but let's compare it with some other instruments that also make use of laser desorption mass spectrometry. For example, the Mars Organic Molecule Analyzer, MOMA, uh, which will fly on the ExoMars mission now. That one has a sensitivity of about 1,000 femtomol per square millimeter. There's another uh, couple of laboratory prototypes that are being developed uh, by various other groups, and those usually have a sensitivity uh, just below 1,000 femtomol per square millimeter. So what we're seeing here is that we can uh, get almost two orders of magnitude better sensitivity, which is of course incredibly important on Europa to find these trace amounts of biomolecules. So what this work really shows is that with the origin system and laser desorption mass spectrometry, we have the tools to uh, identify ice on Europa's surface and identify biomolecules that may indicate uh, life that's present on the, uh, in its subsurface ocean. Well, we can do more. We have now looked at Mars uh, for extinct life, Europa for existing life, um, but laser mass spectrometry can be applied to a whole range of other applications. Uh, for example, we can go to Python and see if there are biomolecules present in uh, the methane lakes in a very different environment than we are used to here on Earth. Or we can use it uh, for asteroid uh, measurements. Uh, for example, uh, Scott Sanford is a fan of uh, sample return missions, but because our laser mass spectrometry uh, uh, instruments are very lightweight. We could simply stick that on such a sample return mission and first do a chemical analysis of an asteroid to determine what the uh, most valuable, scientifically valuable location is for a sample return mission. Uh, we can look at uh, Triton, a moon of Neptune, and see what kind of chemistry is taking place in its uh, nitrogen ice surface. Uh, we can use it on the moon for future uh, space missions and landings there. Uh, you can have handheld laser mass spectrometers uh, determine the mineralogy of the moon, can use it to search for water and mine that water. And finally, uh, we can also use it for Pluto and any kind of other Kuiper Belt object to see what kind of weird chemistry is taking place there. So just to conclude this presentation, what we can basically do is if the chemical tracers of life are present on a planet, we can employ laser mass spectrometry as a very good tool on landers and rovers to detect these tracers and determine if life is or was present. Now, what you will also note, uh, notice throughout this presentation is that besides some science results, I'm also pitching this very much in a, uh, as a sales pitch, and that is absolutely true. We are developing these tools in the lab. Uh, we have prototypes available and we uh, do all the tests to determine that these instruments work as they uh, should. But what we of course want is to have these tools on landers and on rovers on various space missions. So I heard that there is a lot of NASA people here. Uh, if you are liking what you're seeing here, please tell all your space mission buddies about these uh, instruments and uh, yeah, Let's get talking and determine if we can put these laser mass spectrometers on future landers and rovers. So to wrap up this presentation, a couple of acknowledgements. Uh, first of all, the laser mass spectrometry group in uh, Bern and various collaborators um, of that group. Um, special thanks to Andreas Rido, who you see here in clean room camouflage, working on an instrument for the uh, Jupiter Icy Moon Explorer, um, Jupiter Icy Moon uh, Explorer. Yeah, that was it, indeed. Um, yeah, who has basically been instrumental in uh, developing the origin system. I also want to thank quickly the Bern Astrochemistry Research Group, uh, which was not directly involved in the laser mass spectrometry work, but is still a very nice uh, research environment that we have uh, in Bern to do astrochemical research.
So with that, I really want to thank you, invite you for questions, and um, yeah, start writing those questions in the comments. And a final thing, um, I guess I speak for everyone, uh, since this is the last presentation that uh, yeah, we thank Katie and Brian very much for hosting this seminar series, um, which yeah, we all have enjoyed very much. So thank you. Ah, thank you, Rodrigo. Yes, so we have here a question from uh, Chris Bennett. Um, have you considered these mass spectrometers for the commercial lunar payload surfaces. Um, yes, so we are definitely looking at the options for various kinds of uh, lunar missions. Um, so the most direct benefit that you would have from a laser mass spectrometer on the moon is really doing uh, elemental uh, composition measurements. Uh, we can look for um, yeah, all kinds of yeah, elemental tracers. Uh, for example, you can do lead measurements, which can tell you something about the, um, yeah, how do you call that, the, uh, the age of the moon's surface. Um, so there's a lot of options for that. Secondary would be, for example, this water mining. Um, I, I very much like the asteroid mining angle of these instruments. Um, water will be essential for a future space um, industry. Uh, and one of the first sources that we can potentially get that water is the moon. So laser mass spectrometry or specifically laser absorption could really help um, find deposits of that water and uh, by way of robots um, mine that water. We have a question from Zikin Ni. I'm sorry, I mispronounced your name probably. Um, I wonder, have you seen shot-to-shot -shot variance in your signal intensity and how would that affect your quantification? I'm also curious if you have analyzed other biomolecules such as nucleobases or sugar. Um, so yes, we actually see shot-to-shot -shot variance in, in multiple ways. What I talked about, of course, was already this um, uh, difference from position to position. And that uh, is basically uh, has basically to do with the concentration differences that you have throughout the surface when you yeah, deposit some organic material in your sample holder. Um, so that's one thing we definitely see. Uh, but then when we analyze one position, we actually don't use a single laser pulse, we use uh, 100 laser pulses that we shoot in sequence. And there we also see a shot-to-shot -shot variation uh, where sometimes it can take 20 laser shots before something uh, dissolves from the surface. Um, so it really seems to be sort of a, um, yeah, a gamble almost when uh, organic material will release with laser absorption. But as long as you keep shooting your laser pulses on that one spot, you will eventually see something if it's there. Now, as for your other uh, question on the other biomolecules, uh, no, we have at the moment only worked with amino acids. Um, nucleobases are definitely uh, on the list to eventually analyze. Uh, what we're also looking at is uh, lipids uh, because those are, um, yeah, biotracers that, yeah, probably uh, survive longer in surfaces of Mars or of Europa because they're a little bit more radiation resistant. So these would be a really interesting group to analyze and to show that, for example, the origin system is capable of measuring. I have here a question from Michelle Nuevo. A technical question. Towards the end of your presentation, you showed a mass spectra for amino acid mixtures in which the 
masses seem pretty small for these kind of compounds, 40 or glycine or alanine. Also, it seemed that several amino acids uh, of different molecular masses had a peak at the same mass. Are there any reasons for this? Um, so yes, um, the peak you actually saw 40, that uh, was probably alanine. That's actually uh, 44 off the top of my head. And uh, for glycine, that will be 30. And this is actually something that is interesting to point out uh, because what we noticed is that you see actually nicely in this figure here, is that our amino acids, um, they fragment in a very specific way. And that is mainly uh, that the acid group gets ripped off the amino acid. So if you look here at valine, you will only see this functional part here. Uh, that is basically what we measure. And um, yeah, the acid group, um, is gone. That, that basically becomes a neutral species, so we cannot measure that with mass spectrometry. Um, now, this means, for example, for glycine, that you will only see, uh, I hope it's kind of clear what I'm doing, but you will only see this nitrogen group and this carbon group here, which has a combined mass of 30. So that's why it's pretty small. Um, so also very important to stress, of course, our laser desorption technique does not fragment a lot, but it still does fragment. So just to be clear on that, and that's the reason why that happens. Um, what you're saying about several amino acids uh, having different molecular masses, um, yeah, several amino acids of different molecular masses having a peak on the same mass, um, that basically comes down to the same thing. If this functional group uh, that's breaking, breaking apart and what we are measuring, uh, if that has the same mass, then some of them show up at that same mass. Um, so very, Clear example, but not a very good one for this purpose is, of course, uh, regular alanine and beta alanine. The functional group has a different structure, but the same mass, and we will pick that up. Um, and so there are a couple of other uh, cases where uh, these, these molecules or these fragments can have the same mass and then show up in the same position. So also for quantification and identification, um, it does become important to have a little bit of fragmentation so we can fit a pattern to it. Um, and then distinguish certain molecular contributions, of course. So we have here a question from uh, Alan Chia. I'm sorry, I'm having some difficulty pronouncing that. Um, any plans to use these instruments in the field as a planetary analog test? Yes, that is actually happening. Right now, um, well, not right now, but a couple of months ago, um, these instruments have uh, been used for analysis of uh, Atacama Desert material. Uh, this is actually something that uh, Andreas Rido, who I mentioned at the end of the talk, has been involved in. Um, unfortunately, I cannot tell a lot of details about that right now, but um, I would recommend to send me an email um, and then I can get you in touch with Andreas if you want. My email address is here. Uh, question from Aditi Agarwal. Um, my question is not uh, related to the talk, but a general one. Can you tell me about the scope of astrochemistry? Because I have just turned towards this field and I'm very confused whether it's uh, whether to opt it. Ah, okay, yeah, yeah, I see. Um, so <laughs> I'm, a, I'm, I guess I'm a little bit of an unusual astrochemist in the sense that I don't have an astronomy background at all. Um, what I find interesting is chemistry, just that. So for me, it doesn't really matter if it's in, if it's astronomy related in the interstellar medium or if it's some planets, uh, if you have some funky chemistry going on uh, that we can detect, I'm uh, interested in it. So I would say, uh, um, yeah, if you really have an interest in, in chemistry, uh, then you're in the right place. Then it just, um, yeah, you just need to look around a bit and um, yeah, find the right niche or the right question that you find interesting. And uh, yeah, start going for that. Uh, as for prerequisites uh, to this field, um, well, yeah, 
an interest in chemistry. Yeah, <laughs> really that. Uh, Nicholas Drachman, uh, have you looked at small peptides or only single amino acids? Um, curious if you would see fragmentation of the peptide backbone. This is also on the list of to-do things. Um, there's a lot of classes of molecules that we can potentially investigate and want to investigate, but we have not done that yet. Um, yeah, based on what we have seen now about how fragmentation works with the amino acids, I do think we will have some fragmentation. Um, yeah, probably not exactly on the peptide bond. This will be an interesting question to look into. Cannot give you an exact answer right now. Uh, Lu Chao, um, to follow up on Michelle Nueva's question, do some compounds uh, not fragment at all and happen to have the same mass as amino acids that have been fragmented? Um, We have not seen compounds not fragment at all, I believe. No. It will only be that some uh, compounds are more stable and you will get a more intense um, yeah, signal at the intact mass of that molecule. Uh, for example, the amino acids with the, um, uh, with the benzene rings and, and all the aromatic groups, they're very good at being stable, basically. Um, Yeah, the, the other thing that I can say is um, it will really depend on our measurement methodology as well. Because, of course, at the lower masses, there's a lot of molecules that can potentially show up in your mass spectrum, uh, such as, for example, CO2, which you can confuse with a carboxylic uh, group if that has the signature at mass 44 instead of 45, for example. Um, but then it really depends on your methodology, how to analyze, for example, ice from Europa. Um, what we plan to do is actually evaporate the water, and that would mean that you also lose all kinds of volatiles, such as your uh, N2, your CO2. Uh, so that is no longer present and, and not capable of contributing to the mass spectrum. So I hope that that kind of answers your question. So we can limit some contributions. We have here a, um, another question from Zeke uh, Ni. Uh, another question is that uh, GC pyrolysis will destroy organics, but GC is a good separation technique for chiral molecules. Can laser mass spectrometry help to distinguish chiral molecules to other structural isomers? Um, so chiral molecules are, for me, still a headache case for laser mass spectrometry, unfortunately. Um, I don't think there is really a good way to distinguish chiral molecules as of yet. So we will not be able to, uh, to distinguish between the versions of, uh, well, let's say tyrosine, um, the, the, the left-handed or right-handed version of that. Uh, we will really need to think about some other analysis techniques. Um, maybe we can do something with circularly polarized light, um, but to be honest, I think that will be a long shot and definitely not very well suited for space missions. Any last questions by anyone? All right, well, if no one else has any other questions, I will go ahead and uh, wrap things up. All right, we'd like to thank once again, Dr. Lichtering for the amazing talk and for the extensive questions he's answered today. Uh, and we'd like to thank our audience, not only for joining us today, but for joining us in every webinar episode we've done. We've had so many people come Tuesday and Thursday, week after week. We're so thankful and we're happy that this all worked out so well. Uh, so truly thank you to all of our audience members all around the world for joining us and uh, being so active and engaged in these talks. 
Uh, we'd like to remind you guys once again of the AVS 2020 International Twitter Poster Competition. The Astrochemistry and Space Science category was added. $500 cash prize. Members and non-members are allowed to register. And if you enjoyed our webinar, there are plenty of other webinars and just general discussion and other ways to get involved in astrochemistry and astrobiology. There are the astrochemistry discussion series where you can find a link here. They also do a webinar similar to our format and the uh, ASAP astrobiology webinar series is very similar as well in, uh, in Asia. So their time frame is a little different from ours. Uh, there's NASA's Ask an Astrobiologist show, the Space Cafe Tokyo, uh, plenty of resources and we encourage everyone that enjoyed our webinar to take a look at these other resources and see if these are also interesting to them. And again, we'd like to thank everyone for tuning in and we hope you guys have an amazing rest of the day.